Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to Myth Garden Middle Earth. Uh, happy to be back with you for another week. Uh, funny story, actually. So today, I uh, I went to start streaming, and uh, I was like maybe 10 seconds away from hitting the start streaming button when I remembered that I had gotten my own time wrong and I had set up at the time or rather near the time that I used to start streaming at 1230 that I had forgotten my own time change that I instituted about a month ago. So uh, I almost started like a whole 25 minutes early instead of my normal five minutes late and wouldn't you guys have been confused. Um, but anyway, welcome. So I, I, as always, I'm Corey Olson, the Tolkien Professor, and I am joined by my friend Grifflet, who is not, in fact, cowering near a bonfire today uh, in Forkhel because he is, uh, as you can see, newly and smartly equipped. Would you just look at how adorable Grifflet is? The backs of the mammoths are also very cute. That's right. So he's wearing the furry cloak that he got from Fair Venon, and he's he's um, he's got that going on. But he also got this full set of of cold weather gear uh, sent to him uh, by uh, by by Nitesh, uh, uh, his uh, uh, Grifflet's friend Wiggins' uh, uh, guardian um, mentor. So uh, that was very thanks for that. And I, I think uh, uh, Nitesh, did you say that uh, that uh, Grifflet's uh, normal fashion consultant Terry Adwin helped you with that, or, or you know, consulted uh, on that. I think you were saying that was going to happen. So anyway, I, I'm very, very grateful for uh, the, uh, the 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 lovely cold weather gear. Uh, Griffit was just not prepared for winter when he came up here, and uh, and now he's now he's good. But anyway, all right, he's got to head off because he's got to go see Saya, the seeress or something, uh, to see if she has seen anything about this. Uh, this half ring that's meant to have been found in the bay. You remember Mordrumbor showed up uh, at uh, at uh, 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 Surikaila and uh, was intimidating the locals. So uh, we've got to we've got to figure out what's going on here and see if uh, Grifflet can get through without stealthing. How far are we here? Seriously, how far is this? Everything is far in Forakel. And far enough. Let's get on the pony. Right. Okay. This has got to be another dwarf fortress, right? I mean, I'm only saying that because the only stone constructions we've found up here have been uh, dwarf constructions. And from a distance, this looks kind of dwarfish. All right. Is this the cave? Under the shadow of the... Uh... Uh, yeah, I think so. Okay. So she's not actually in... The fortress. She's, uh, yeah, right. Okay. She's next to the fortress. It seems a prudent place to go. All right. In we go. Oh, this looks warm and cozy in here. Hello there, serious lady. May I be of help to you? I do come from Iriana. Yeah, you have no fear of the stone dwellers from Angmar. Oh, good. Yeah. They can do you no harm. Excellent. Yeah, well, good. I mean, me, me neither. We're pretty much alike in that. I will share with you what wisdom I have. Long ago, a king from the south came into Forakel. He sure did, didn't he? Seeking refuge from the witch king of Angmar. Arvedui was his right name, but we called him the Gaunt King uh, because he was fra uh, frail from hiding in the ancient mines of the dwarves. Yeah, he was He was all, like, wasted with hunger and stuff. Not the Gaunt King and it's like the Gaunt Lords or anything. Totally unrelated. Gaunt in a totally different sense. In a, just a purely physical, literal sense, right? Anyway, the Gaunt King begged for aid from the Lossoth, which was given but hesitantly, for the Lossoth feared the wrath of the Witch King. The Gaunt King stayed with the Lossoth until a great sea monster appeared in the Ice Bay bearing many elves. B by which you mean the ship, right? Yeah. They're using all of the, all of these terms, the Gaunt King and the you know the the business with the sea monster and everything. That's all in that's all in Appendix A, um, in that one story about the Lossoth that we get in the Tolkien Corpus. We warned the Gaunt King not to go forth upon the back of the beast, but to wait for the summer, so that the power of the Witch King would not be so strong. Yeah, exactly. Just what happened. Uh, interesting. Uh, so like seventy-five percent or something of the story. Um, of Arvedui 
uh, and uh, the Lawsoth is being put into the into the mouth of Saya here, the seeress, which is actually really kind of a kind of a kind of a, an interesting choice. Interesting, I say, because we're not getting it from the Dunedain perspective, which is what you would rather expect, right? I mean, Appendix A, um, you know, the the story as it's told in Appendix A is not exactly. Um, is not exactly something that was compiled by the Lawsoth, right? I mean, that's obviously the Dunedain perspective. Appendix A, you know, the, the materials of Appendix A were presumably compiled in Gondor, right? So, uh, so what it suggests then, sort of like the, the kind of metatextual situation that uh, that the game has created here, um, is uh, is that um, the basically it suggests that the text that descended to us through Appendix A in The Lord of the Rings um, is very, must have been very faithful in its transmission of these particular names and phrases, right? That, that's kind of, the, that's kind of the, the concept here, because she is clearly retaining the memory of the Lossoth tale of that, uh, of, that whole, of that whole situation. So that's kind of fun. All right. Uh, right. Uh, he would not listen, and the storms slew the beast. Yeah, I know, man. That was awful. It is said that the body of the beast may yet be seen in the ice bay. Yep, saw it from a distance, north and east of here. It may be that you may find the knowledge you seek upon its corpse. <laughs> that's kind of right. Searching a shipwreck uh, being the same thing as looting the corpse of the sea monster. Okay. Griffith loots the corpse of a sea monster. That sounds like fun. Let's go do that. Huh. <laughs> Hang on a second. So I'm getting uh, getting reports that there's... My sound is weird? What the heck is wrong with my sound? Hmm... How about now? Is that better? It's weird. I don't know if anyone else has this issue. OBS just kind of randomly changes my settings in ways that I never expect. Is that better? Okay. All right. I think I found the problem. No idea what happened there. My apologies. Um, okay. Off we go to loot the corpse of the sea monster. There it is. Well, you can see. I love how... How the Sierras is like, you know, it has been told that, like, the body of the sea ma uh, monster can still be seen. Yeah, like, it has been told by anyone who just steps outside your front door, right? And there it is. This is great. And it's, it's, it's snowing now, scenically, right? Instead of, uh, uh, instead of that terrible fog that we were getting before. I want to make sure I can see. I, I got to dodge mobs here, so I can't be just staring off into the distance the whole time. Much as I enjoy doing that in Forakel. Okay. I love how there's a grazing elk in the middle of a like a snowy field in which there is no vegetation. But you know, it's a doubtless a, an extremely resourceful elk. Let's see, okay. I think uh, it's the next fjord over, right? Yeah, there we go. All right, there's the path. Woo! Almost lagged my way right off the cliffs. All right, I think I'm going to have to fight some of these fellas. Oh, yeah? Come over here and say that. Oh, running away, huh? I didn't think so. Okay. Oh, right. So interesting. Who set up the... Um, is this like a... Alright, so somebody set up a bunch of... Hey, guy. Yeah, you're totally about to attack me now. Right, 
let's do this. Um, so somebody set up all these, you know, tusks and whale bones and wind breaks and stuff over here. Is this the work of the Garudine? Is this the work of the Lawsong? Hmm, I wonder what happened there. I have a theory. Here's my theory. See, I think this has become a tourist spot. That's what I think. How about you stealth yourself here, Griffith? Slaying Gowardine is getting tedious. I think this has become a tourist spot. And, uh... So, therefore... Hey, wait a second. Am I in the right place? I am, right? This looks like the way to the ship. Excuse me, everybody. Pardon me. Yeah. So I think that this is like where they... Oops. Oh, great. Griffith, that was a poor time for a stealth failure, I gotta tell you. Yep, no, I think this is set up as a tourist trap, basically. Right, these are the uh, the sort of the fences to keep the, this is where, you know, they form, the, form an Oroe EQ, right, in order to see the, sh the sea monster, right? And these guys are the, the, the guards, or possibly they check the tickets. I'm pretty sure I can see the scheme that's going on here. That's a cunning scheme, but, all oh, right. Look at that elvish sea monster. Wow, look! It's our veggie! He's still here! Hey, man. Oh, good to see that you have a lower jaw, anyway. Uh, unlike so many of the other shades that I've met. <laughs> okay. Our victory, that's a little anticlimactic, right? I just met the shade of one of the ancient kings of Arnor, you know, the last king of Arnor, one of the one of the famous figures of Middle Earth history. And as I stand before him, the first thing he does is scratch his armpit, right? That's 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 a little a little anticlimactic there. Um and now he's checking his watch. Hey our Vedui <laughs> No, no, I'm not of the Lawsoth. Um, I'm a hobbit. Yeah, you uh, from your lands of old. You, you uh, uh, see now that's lovely, isn't that lovely? Our Vegui remembers the hobbits, right? Whereas history forgets them, right? But our Vegui remembers, and of course he would, because the 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 people from the Shire sent a, a troop of archers uh, to the Battle of Fornost, right? Remember we had that. Um, we had that set of adventures in Budgeford, right, with that hobbit who is the descendant of one of those hobbit archers at, at, at who's like, remember that, that hillman from the north who came down <laughs> gunning for that hobbit uh, because his, like, ancestor had been killed by the hobbit archer? Uh, uh, good times. But anyway, all right, so Arvedui remembers the troop of hobbits who came and, uh, and fought with him at, at Fornost. That's really great, right? So the, the, the men of Gondor and everything might think that the halflings are people of myth and whatever, but our veggie, he knows the truth. Why come ye into this terrible place? Just to chat, really? Okay, but he still does that thing that the rest of the shades do, so uh, that's uh, a little bit disturbing. It's okay, we can just talk, our veggie. It's, it's fine. I don't speak, you know, um, uh, uh, sort of guttural shade. Thou dost not belong in this place, but it matters not. Alas, so much evil has befallen this world. I know, right? I remain here in penitence, for my own curse was brought down upon my head. Oh, that's how you explain the fact that you're here, 
right? Like, why did your shade remain here by the ship? Because I was going to ask. I mean, it seems like an impolite question, so I was kind of nervous to ask that question. But I was wondering, I have to admit, why indeed your shade didn't leave the circles of the world as, you know, as kind of supposed to, like the shades of men. But so you're kind of... It's like you're an oathbreaker, except you're not an oathbreaker. You're you cursed yourself. Okay, so tell me, tell me more about this. Um, uh, okay, okay. Uh, let's see. In pride, I ignored the warnings of the Lossoth. Right, for I wish to return to my kingdom. Yeah. Well, you know, okay, Arved, I think you're being a little hard on yourself. I mean, yes, you wanted to return to your kingdom. And, and yeah, I mean, you could say it was pride. You know, like the Wasath said, don't go. And you were like, nah, don't worry, you primitive savages. You Because, I mean, it's true. Like, they didn't understand about the ship, right? The elves brought a perfectly serviceable ship. Uh, Kierden, the shipwright, sent the sent the ship up to rescue Arvedui. And they were all like, it's a sea monster. And so I can totally understand how you and, indeed, the elvish mariners would have been like, dude, actually, it's fine. We do this all the time. We're trained professionals. Don't try this at home. So, I, you know, I, I think you're being a little hard to be like, ah, oh, in my pride and arrogance, I, 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 I ignored them. I mean, because also, I mean, Arvedui, think about it from the Elvish Mariner point of view, right? I mean, here they trooped all the way up and they their ship was already there. What were they going to do? You know, like, uh, uh, you know, abandon it? Or, I mean, I guess they could have, they also could have wintered with the Lossoth and everything, but of course they might, likely would have pointed out that that would have been possibly more harmful for their ship. That anyway, so you know, it's it's um, uh, it was kind of a freak storm, you know. But whatever, um, Arvedue, I understand you feel bad and you're here in penitence. So let me let you finish uh, talk, telling me about that. Okay, the storms of the ice bay brought ruin to the vessel and all aboard her. And in despair and wrath, I cursed myself for my pride. Oh, now that's not in the story that comes down through the Dunedain. They missed that part. As, of course, why wouldn't they, right? Because they didn't see it, right? They only just heard about this from the Lossoth afterwards. And, of course, that makes perfect sense of the other thing we were talking about, about about uh, the Cirrus, whose name I've already forgotten. So, so, Satya or something? Anyway, whatever. Um... Because, of course, that's how the entire story of the Gaunt King came down and entered into Appendix A in the first place, because none, none of them survived. Um, it was only when the Dunedain afterwards came up north because they were like, okay, Arvedui fled to the north, Kyrdan sent a ship, and none of the, a lot of them were ever heard from again, so what's going on? Uh, so they went up to the north, and they found the Lossoth, and they heard the story, and recovered, of course, the Ring of Bari here, although not the Palantiri, uh, because those were lost in the bay. Um, but uh, anyway, okay, so, so of course it would make sense that the story that is recorded in Appendix A would be very close to the story that the Lossoth themselves tell, because, of course, it is derived entirely from the story that the Wasath themselves tell, so that's wonderful. But anyway, anyway, sorry. So, but this part, like, what actually happened in the last hours of King Arvedui aboard the ship? Who knows, right? We weren't there. Nobody was there. It wasn't recorded. So, um, so all right, Arvedui, I'm, I'm, I'm all ears. So, you, you cursed yourself for your pride. Redemption does not lay, uh, nor does it lie. I suspect. Beyond hope, however, and those who follow in my footsteps may yet bring me peace. Hey, is that, does that mean me? Right? Can Griffith help to bring you peace, Arvedui? That would be awesome. In the dwarf mines south in Lansima, where we first hid from the agents of the Witch King, we were forced to abandon many things. One such item was a book of heraldry, which details the lineage of my people. Go forth and find it, then bring it to the Dunedan who watches these cold lands at Suri Kaila. He will take it to his lord. By which you mean Aragorn. Got it. Okay. So there's a long lost book of heraldry. Okay. I read you not going to pretend. That's like a little bit disappointing, right? I would could kind of wish that it was like, you know... I left my ancient and uh, uh, and powerful blade in the keeping of, you know, whatever. But, like, a book of heraldry seems a little bit... Oh, yeah, right, okay. Just me, me discovering things in Forkow. Okay, so anyhow, um, it, um, that, you know, it would be kind of cool if it were something slightly more dynamic and, frankly, useful than a book of heraldry. But I get it. It's all about your heritage, right? It's all about the, the line of the Dunedain. And it's of historical interest, which will certainly uh, interest the Dunedain. Um, so, uh, so that's cool. So, all right, fine. Um, I'll go sneak and I'll bring it 
to the Duna. I remember seeing the Dunedon uh, in uh, Surikawa, so I can I can do that. Not a problem. He'll probably send me all the way back over here. That's all right. I'm gonna sneak in past the guards again because I didn't buy a ticket. I see people in the chat room are thinking I should uh, I should buy a snow globe in the gift shop, but I can't afford one. You know how much those things cost? I mean, like they just these these Gowradine just absolutely rob you at that gift shop man it's never worth it like whenever you're here like it's all it's all a trap you know like your kids are begging for one of the four hell snow globes and and uh you know but i'm telling you it's the path to ruin okay um i'm going to get a, presumably a slow horse no wait i gotta go to the um because this is uh this is over in yes over by Ziegelgund. Um, so I'm probably going to get a slow horse down to Ziegelgund. Um, no, I can't remember. I don't recall any reference, any specific reference to anything like that. Um, where's the where's the village? Am I headed the right direction? I think I am. Um, uh, yeah, I want to find my friend, the stable master. Hello? Hello, village? Anyone seen a mammoth? Aha! Uh -huh. Yeah, there we go. Alright. Um, see, this is kind of fascinating to me. There's a perfectly good fortress up here, right? A perfectly good stone fortress. And yet we build a little village with whalebone down here and hides. Like, you know, it's like a cultural thing, and maybe it's haunted up there. Nothing would surprise me less. Um, and that's why they don't live there, but you'd think, like, that looks like a recyclable, even a reusable fortress, right? I mean, and that'd be presumably an upgrade? I talked to, see, Griffith was standing over there by the Mammoth Keeper because he had been trying to catch a mammoth ride, like, all last week, but it didn't work out. Never does. It's never going to happen, Griffith. Just give up. It's never going to happen. Okay. It's a priest day, oh, is it not? Darn it. Not going to happen. All you can do is go to Surikaila and I must complete the Frozen War quest. Oh, well. Fine. Oh, very finicky and not exceptionally helpful, Stable Master. I think Griffith is going to de declare uh, uh, Kir Sika, the sa stable master of Kuru Lairi, his unfriend. That's it. Sorry, I've been uh, reading about the Green Elves of Osiria this uh, past week uh, in the uh, Mythgard Academy class in the Lost Road. Um, and actually, this reminds me... Um, oh, yes. Yes. Sorry, I was being reminded to look at the... Uh, I said I'm not paying very ca uh, careful attention to my notes here. Um, hang on a second. I wanted to share one thing here while I'm going, which I can't drive at the same time I'm doing this. Right? You should never be checking your email at the same time as you're driving. I got an email uh, this past week from a viewer, a uh, viewer, longtime uh, Mythgard friend, Peter Ribsky, um, who uh, has... He's uh, with... Is it... No, I'm going to embarrass myself. Uh, Peter, because I can't remember which branch of the military you're with. Are you with the Navy? I know you're at sea, but that doesn't necessarily mean that you're with the Navy. Uh, anyway, um, so he's uh, he 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 works in a in a an aircraft carrier, and um, has been learning Finnish because he's been recently posted uh, up in that direction. Uh, so he was sending me an email about how much fun it was for him. He has uh, he he's. You know, one of the people who who started one of the uh, the uh, uh, Tolkien fans and listeners to to my podcast and Mythgard stuff, who has started uh, uh, playing Lotro since I started the stream, and uh, oh, it is Navy. Okay, good. He's here with us today. Thanks, thanks, Peter. Anyway, um, uh, so he sent me an email about how much fun it was for him to come to Forkel for the first time, and uh, and recognize uh, a lot of these. He's, he's been carefully studying Finnish, concerning which, great job. Uh, Peter, because Finnish is a darn difficult language. Tolkien had a uh, had a hard time uh, with it. In fact, he he claims that he failed Finnish, um, that he could never really master it. He loved it, but he could never really master it. Um, 
Uh, in fact, he, that's the, uh, if I'm remembering correctly, it's Finnish, of which he used that sort of fun military metaphor uh, when he said that uh, he made an assault upon Finnish uh, but was routed foot and horse. Um, uh, but, of course, we have to remember that when it comes to, when you're talking about, like, mastering a language, Tolkien standards are not exactly the normal standards for that. So when he says, like, that he really failed uh, Finnish, um, I'm kind of thinking that most of us, if we had the same amount of competence in Finnish that Tolkien had indeed mastered, we would probably not consider that a failure. Just a guess. Just suspecting that um, uh, his his proficiency in, in Finnish was probably pretty good by normal person standards. But of course, as a as a philologist, he did have uh, very different ways of, of thinking about um, uh, of thinking about the the language acquisition and language mastery. Um, all right, so let's see where are we here? Oh, we're getting close. Uh, yeah, do I want to go through the swamps? I don't think I do want to go through the swamps actually. Kind of, I'm thinking I want to go around those. Not swamps that, you know, that, whoa. I've disturbed a whole party over there. Would you stop throwing spears at my horse? That's really annoying. I'm trying to tell you the story from Peter. So, okay, so anyway, so what Peter was uh, was pointing out, of course, um, and as, as many of you probably know, and as I think I mentioned, or maybe I forgot to mention, but I meant to mention, um, of course, all of the all of the the names and everything up here um, are Finnish, which is a which is which is a, a wonderful move uh, by Turbine, a totally non-random move, uh, not, and not just because Tolkien loved Finnish, but of course, as many people know, Finnish was the linguistic inspiration of one of Tolkien's Elvish languages. It's the it's the it's the inspiration of Quenya. Quenya is uh, uh, it's it's not exactly. Well, I mean, it's sort of inspired by it. It's it's kind of based on it. It's uh, it's in any case. Um, hang on, this is actually really not where I'm supposed to be. Yeah, I just kind of went to Ziegelgund itself here without thinking about it, but it's really, in fact, the mines that I want to go to. Um, anyhow, so um, I uh, so Finnish, Elvish, Quenya. Yeah. So um, so anyway, it's. It's basically the, the the sort of the the sound patterns of Finnish. Um, he really loved, and um, and so he modeled he modeled the sound of of Quenya on the sound of Finnish, um, and it's it's something that is. Oh, this bear is following me. Oh, come on now. All right, Mr. Tundra Bear. Uh, so anyway, so Finnish is, is a, as I say, it's, it's a very important language for Tolkien. Tolkien, of course, was also fascinated by Finnish for another reason, which is that Finnish is a very philologically interesting language. Um, it's one of the two, it's one of the two or three languages um, spoken in all of Europe, uh, which is not related to any of the rest of them. Uh, that is, you know, Philologically speaking, you can trace the roots of, of, of you know all of the major you know languages and language groups of of uh, of, of Europe and Asia uh, back to Proto Indo European, um, which was kind of a, a, a really fun cottage industry uh, of the nineteenth century, um, and uh, but not Finnish. Finnish is one of the um, is one of those languages which which has in fact no linguistic relationship to any of the other languages. That was awesome. Did you see that? I never noticed that before. When I'm stealth and I go through the bush, the branches move apart. That was cool. Sorry. Anyway, um, uh, I don't know why I never noticed that small effect before, but that was neat. Okay, so anyhow... Um, so the point is, he was already interested in Finnish, and he really loved the Kalevala, which is the, the, you know, the national epic of Finland. Um... And uh, um, you know was was deeply influenced by the Kalevala, and not just the 
the stories of the Kalevala itself, the whole concept of the Kalevala and the way that Lonrot um, in the 19th century had, you know, gone around the, the land and, and collected old stories and put and basically sort of rediscovered and, and uh, uh, reestablished the traditional mythology of Finland. Um, that project was something that deeply influenced him and is re was really at the very root of Tolkien's entire mythology from the beginning. Um, you know, he was like the Elvish long rot, right? He was going, he, so he was going to, to, to go through and put together this new Elvish mythology, this new English mythology, ultimately. Um, kind of like Lonrot did uh, in, in Finland. So, so Finnish and Finland uh, had uh, you know, a lot of significance to Tolkien uh, himself. And so this is why when Turbine went to uh, to make Forakel, they uh, they chose Finnish as the languages here. Okay, am I just supposed to like frisk dwarves, hoping that one of them is hauling around the Book of Heraldry? Hmm, I wonder. Let's look around for a Book of Heraldry. There's a lever down there. I wonder if that's going to come in useful at some point. Hey, do you have a book of heraldry? If I kill you, will that... No. No, really. Looters and miners down here. Doesn't really seem... Darn it. I tarried by the looter. Three of them now? That's not good, guys. Come on now. your friends friends regen while I still here. I think I've got you, man. Oh yeah. Okay. Let's see. How about some Lembus over here? While we're here, Grifflet. Okay. Um Okay. All right, so we're looking. Did any of you loot, you looters, loot a book of heraldry? Have you seen a book of heraldry? Several hundred years old. Um, I suppose a, your captain carries something like that, does he? No? No. And you just want me to defeat Dower Hands. Which is always fun, don't get me wrong, but... I, whoa, what's going on over here? I love how this captain is just standing here watching his guys fighting an abominable snowman. It's all good. Yeah, the Pico. Oh yeah, no, you guys are doing a great job. You keep it up. I'll take the snowman. Yeah, yeah, five silver on the abominable snowman there. Um, yeah, I'll put, I'll put five silver on the bumble. How about that? Okay, yeah, right, you guys are mining away. Don't let me disturb you. I understand, right? You guys are on the intense uh, mining and looting shift down there, so let me... Uh... Oh, yeah, that's not actually a bridge, is it? Keep sneaking around here. Oops. Yeah, that was not, in fact, it. Went right off the edge. Okay. So, there was a lever. There it is. Ooh, look at that. Huh. Oh, yeah. Sorry. 
Fuck. Whoa. It's a very short turn lever. Great, so I can't wait for my stealth to... All right, hang on. Hang on, then. I got you. I can outsmart you. Now I see how this works. Okay. All right, you guys. Oh, we got some more architecture in here. used to being over level for places. Not that he's terribly over level for here, but much more than he used to be. Remember back in Gartha Garwin when all the quests were red for poor Griffith. Alright, this looks really promising. I mean all these dwarves, they're not even busy looting. They look like guards. So I think this must be a place I'm meant to go. Ancient vases around here. Okay. Hey, everybody. All right. Foreman's quarters. Maybe the. F oh, I don't have the corresponding quest. Okay. So I guess he doesn't have the uh, Book of Heraldry. Hmm. Hmm, I wonder. Let's look over here. Oh, yeah. I see we, we have here the frontier of the Dowerhand and Pico domain. You guys keep up the good work. These Pico are jumping up and down all over the place. Is this a dance? Is this a ritual thing? Is this like Zumba or something? Maybe that's what this is. Savage Pico Zumba. I bet somewhere there's a Lossoth garage band named Savage Pico Zumba. That's my theory. What are they beating on? Oh, the corpses of dower hands. I see. They've hauled some dower hands in here and they're just pounding on their corpses. All right. Um. Good show. Don't let me disturb you. This guy's just mad because he doesn't have a dower hand corpse of his own to beat. So he's beating on the wall in frustration. I bet you could really, you could make like a nice music video here, you know. With the right background music. The, yikes. That was funny. He came over and danced in my direction prior to even noticing me. What's up with that? <laughs> I just riddled you to death. That's embarrassing. Okay. So, um, let me just check down here. Excuse me. Yeah. No, you do your thing. Don't let me interrupt your dance moves there. Okay. I'm looking for a book. And you guys don't have it, right? No, of course you don't have it. Why would you have a book of heraldry? You are way too excitable to be sitting around reading a book of heraldry. As are you guys. 
Oh, and there's the other frontier fighting dower hands over there. And over here, the dance goes on. Okay. All right. But these guys are... They must they must burn calories like nobody's business. I mean, the Pico... Look at this. Look at this. They, just, they don't even walk places. They swing and jump and smash things. They are just a continual blur of cardio activity. Oh, they've got some dower hand corpses. They're playing the dower hand corpses over there. It's like a musical instrument among the Pico. Percussion instrument, obviously. They're really into percussion. All right. Okay. So that was fun, uh, but I didn't find any books. Yeah. Really quite low on literature as a whole, uh, this uh, mine has been so far. Yeah. Which way to the library, fellas? Yeah, surely you have a circulating library down here in this mine? Oh, you've just cornered this guy? Yeah, okay. You do your thing. Okay. Huh. Well, nothing down here, huh? Where did I come from? This is where I came from. There. Where's the stupid book of heraldry? I'm gonna go through here to where those other, where those other guys were. Oh. <laughs> There's another dowry end corpse he was beating on over there. I didn't even notice that. <laughs> Sorry, they just cracked me up. Oh, yeah. Those two down the alley beating on corpses. Was it around the corner here? Where... <sighs> hey, don't make me beat on you. You were having so much fun, and you had to go and ruin it. I was just enjoying you, you know, cavort and caper around, right? The capers and frisks of the, uh, of the Pico. Where was that other front? There it was. Yeah, excuse me, fellas. I'm going to come down here and see because there are dower hands down here. Is this where the library is, guys? Down here? Oh, uh, no, no. No circulating library there. Uh, okay. Excuse me, guys. Hey! There it is! Look, it's just lying about! Look, this book is like 500 years old! More than that! It's like a thousand years old! Is that any way to treat... Okay, Mr. Dower hand, Captain. When I let this looter pass by, because I don't particularly want to fight both of you at once, but when he passes by, I am going to give you a piece of my mind for just kicking around a thousand-year-old book in the snow like that. Yeah. Let that be a lesson to you. Really is different using a burglar for this kind of thing. If I were with my guardian, I would have had to depopulate this mine three times over to find it. Phew, okay. Well, that was easy. Let's see. I. Oh, shoot, yeah. Oh, it doesn't help all that much. save that in case I need to go back and talk to Arvedui again. 
All right, let me see if I can get out. Okay, obviously I can get out that way. I remember the way out through the dancing pico and back up. So anyway, so let me finish uh, telling you my story, if I can remember to take the correct turns on the way out and talk at the same time, which, as we know, is always a challenge. Those of you who have been watching for a long time and remember the fun days when I got lost in uh, the old forest, for instance, among the spiders, uh, because I can't talk and walk at the same time. Um, it's pretty much pretty much that same thing. So, okay. Um, uh, all right. Um... Okay, so I was I want I was wanting to tell you about Peter's observations. Uh, uh, now that he's been learning Finnish and playing the game, so um, it's 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 very delightful to me not only that uh, the turbine folks um, used Finnish up here, but the way they used Finnish um, is actually really cool. I think um, uh, I don't know Finnish myself. Uh, but uh, again, Peter Ripsky, who has been learning it, was telling me um, that it's really that like. OK, I was going to say, did I run into a dead end while I was talking? Uh, Suri Kaila, for instance, um, literally means large village in Finnish. And uh, uh, there's a Itama and Lansi Ma, right? Ma just means land um, in, uh, in Finnish. Oh, yeah, here's the lever. I'll get myself right up here. Um, so uh, uh, Itama and Lansima uh, literally mean East Land and West Land uh, in Finnish. Um, and uh, that's uh, 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 Kura, uh, C-O-I-R-A, uh, literally means, it, it, it means dog. Uh, so you, you, you see that around. And uh, Ya, uh, J-A-A, means ice. Um, so there's, but anyway, I, th you know, that, that might seem... If that seems to you like a cop out to be like call it the West Land and the East Land, you know, to call it the Eastern part of Forkel East Land and the Western part West Land, that's exactly what Tolkien did. Um, all over the place, that's what Tolkien did. Um, so many of his own names are basically just that exact kind of thing, um, where he takes just a simple word um, and literally, you know, sort of. Uh, very simply and literally translates it. Um, and you'll remember those, you know, Hobbit fans will recall that he does the same thing in English, right? It's not just in, uh, it's not just in, um, uh, in like the Elvish languages and stuff, you know, the Elvish names and things that he does this. Um, he, he does this in English too. I mean, almost all of the names in the Hobbit, the English names for things in the Hobbit um, are just really simple. You know, there's like, the hill and the town of uh, and the river which is called the water right and the um uh and the town which is called there are two there's like hobbiton which is the town of hobbits and uh by water which is the town by the water right and uh and every rivendell the city of dale because it's in the valley next to the mountain. This is why, of course, as I've complained about this before, I found it so hilarious that uh, in the movie they put Dale up on a hill. I'm like, that's so, so deeply wrong. <laughs> I mean, it's you know, I'm not just saying like it's, you know, it's you've done it wrong films. I just mean it's really funny. Like, it's really ironic. I mean, you take a hill, who's, a, a town whose name, their name literally is Valley, right? Um... I mean, like, any time you have the city of Valley up on a hill, that's funny, right? I mean, that's just, uh, that's, anyhow. Um, so, what do you uh, want? Tolkien did that all the time. I'm going to go to Suri Kaila by slow travel if I can, because that'll give me some uninterrupted time to talk without worrying about getting lost. Um, anyway, so, so Tolkien did the same thing. Um, uh, you know, we talked, for instance, last time, I think, about, like, Forodwyth, for instance, which just means, like, the north area, you know, the northern, the northern wastes. So, um, uh, so, you know, doing that kind of thing, Itama and Lansima, is, uh, is, is very Tolkienian. That's exactly how Tolkien's, uh, you know, nomenclature system so very often worked. Um, just to, to, it's very, you know, you do it very simply. And, of course, he wasn't doing that because he was lazy. He was doing that for purposes of... Um, for purposes of verisimilitude, essentially. I mean, that's, in fact, how a lot of 
things get named and how a, a lot of regions get named. Um, you know, I mean, you think of, uh, I mean, we see this a lot out here on the East Coast and in New England, you know, all these road names, um, which are just the names of the local towns. And of course, they were called that because they were named that way in the 18th century, those roads, um, when it was like, you know, the road to that town, because it was the only way to get to that town from where you are, right? So you... Um, you know, so you're you're on the you know you're on the Boston Post Road because it's the road to Boston that uh, uh, that that uh, the post goes goes on. So anyway, it's it's just it's the way that people do names, and so it's the way that Tolkien did uh, a lot of his own names. Of course, he did multiple names, right? This is one of the reasons why things do have multiple names because different people call them different things, and they accumulate different names when different things happen in them. Uh, and of course, that's a very famous thing happening in uh, um, in uh, Tolkien's works. So anyway, okay. Um, while I'm on the road to Surikata, which I shall be for some time, I wanted to answer another lore question. I don't see any new lore questions that have come in this week, so I will do one of my old ones. Um, I'll, I'll, I'm going I'm to address one of the uh, Josh Ramsey questions um, that I've had for a while, and I haven't talked about it because um, I just haven't gotten around to it. But but I wanted to talk about this one today because we just talked about this in the Mythgard Academy class this past Wednesday, so it's sort of fresh in my mind, so I thought I would address it. And the question is about that passage in the Silmarillion, which suggests that not only that humans have free will, but that the will of humans is free in a different way or to a greater extent than the wills of elves. Um, in the Silmarillion, so we're talking about the gift of men, the gift of death that men have. Um, but of course, it's not the gift of death that it's that it emphasizes. It says that they will have they will have a freedom, uh, a freedom to shape their own lives um, beyond outside the you know beyond the music of the Ainur, which is as fate to all things else. Um, and the implication of that, um, the implication of that passage, what, what would seem to be the implication of that passage, um, is that it's that elves don't have free will, right? I mean, if you take what he says there totally literally, he suggests that elves, in fact, don't have free will. Humans have free will, but elves don't have free will. And this is something that kind of bothers a lot of people when reading the Silmarillion because they're like, wait, do elves not have free will? Like, so everything elves do is, 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 is predestined. You know, that's, um, um, that seems a little strange, right? That seems a little harsh, um, and a little hard to understand, right? Well, okay. So here's what I would generally have to say about that. First of all, there are two things that I would say about it. Firstly, I wouldn't, if anyone is worried about this sort of disturbing conclusion that elves don't have free will, um, the main thing I would say is that if elves don't have free will, they sure act like they do. I mean, I don't think that the idea of the uh, the will of the elves being enslaved, that the elves, elves don't actually make their own choices, they, um, you know, they're, they're, they're like mere puppets of the Valar or of Luvatar or something. Um, that uh, that doesn't seem to me to be in any way relevant to the stories that we actually read, especially in the Silmarillion itself, right? I mean, the fact that the elves are acting in ways which certainly to the Valar are undesirable. Um, uh, in that same passage in the Silmarillion, the same passage it talks about the freedom of men, it says that the that, that men are, you know, in many ways are sort of most like Melkor, uh, more, like Morgoth, like Sauron's old boss, um, of the children of Iluvatar, and that they often are are a grief to Manwë, the lord of the of the Valar, and the uh, uh, the vicegerent of you know the the, the sort of the, the delegated ruler of Middle Earth under Iluvatar. Um, but we also know on that same exact ground that, like, Feanor and his actions were a grief to Manwë. We know this on account of we actually see Manwë crying about the deeds of Feanor and the choices that Feanor makes. Um, and in fact, you can see there are some really close parallels between Feanor specifically and, and Melkor. Um, so the sort of the likeness there and the way in which 
Tolkien depicts elves not just kind of doing their own thing and acting as if they have free will, but turning away and acting against the will, uh, you know, acting outside the, um, the, the decrees of Iluvatar and rebelling against the Valor and all this stuff. It's pretty clear that they have the freedom to do that, uh, and indeed later on in the story, it's it, 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 the story emphasizes that the Valar let them choose, like they let them do their own thing rather than coming in and trying uh, to compel them, uh, like the Noldor, to stay in in Valinor, for instance, or uh, uh, and they don't even try to persuade them, much less compel them. Um, so they. The freedom of the elves to act and to choose. Hey, squirrel, still lost, squirrel? It's over there, the woods. Anyway, um, uh, so it, it's, um, as I say, I, I don't lose much sleep over the free will of the elves. It's pretty obvious that they have free will. But then, of course, this leads us to another problem. If the elves do have free will and they clearly can shape their own choice, and many of them choose to shape their own, shape their own path, quite contrary to the will of Iluvatar and against the entire plan, then what on earth does Tolkien mean in that passage? Why does he even say that, in what sense then are men more free? Right? What then is the gift of Iluvatar? And I think, um, and this is something, again, coming back to the class we had uh, on Wednesday evening, um, I don't know if you've ever read the History of Middle-earth series. We're talking about The Lost Road, which is volume five of the History of Middle-earth series. We're going through that book chapter by chapter and talking it through. Um, I, uh, I, I, I recommend that the, near the very end of this past week's class. All the class sessions are up on YouTube, by the way. If you go to the Signum University YouTube channel, you can see all of the sessions of all the classes for the Mythgard Academy we've ever done. Um, and the one from this past week, I, I, we, you, can, you, can, you can sort of see the passage, because um, we were talking about the Aino Windele, which is where this passage in the Silmarillion is. Um, and, uh, but we were looking at the older version of the Silmarillion, of the Aino Windele, that Tolkien wrote in the late 1930s. And it was the second version ever, basically, of the Aino Windele. And um, in that version, he phrases things differently, and he, he just the, the sort of the emphasis falls a little bit differently. And it's pretty clear to me, uh, especially clear from that um, earlier version, that the emphasis of the passage is not on the freedom of will, exactly. That's not the point of the gift of men. The point of the gift of men is on their ultimate destination. The gift that he gives them is that they shall depart from the world, that they shall seek after something outside and beyond the world, that they are not content within the world of Middle-earth. Elves and Valar are within the world. Now remember, um, that the music of the Ainur is what made and shapes and determines the world, both, you know, sort of frames it in space, that is, it, 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 it's, what, how, it's what brought about, you know, what brought the world into being, but it also frames it in time, from the history of the world, from creation to the end of the world. All of that stuff is contained, that entire frame of the world is contained within the music of the Ainur. The elves remain within the world, and the, the Valar are bound within the world for the scope of its entire history. They have entered into time. That's what happens there in the Aino Lindale. But human beings are not. Um, they seek for something beyond the world. And when they die, they go out, they go beyond the world. And they leave that frame behind entirely. That is the emphasis in that passage. So when it says that men have the ability to shape their fate beyond the music of the Ainur, it doesn't mean, like, how free are the choices that I can make. That's not the, the whole point. The point is they determine their fate, their destiny, lies outside the frame of the music of the Ainur, which is as fate to all things else. It told the story, right? It foretold the story of the unfolding of the story of Arda, right, of the world itself. But men are not bound to that story. Ultimately, the story that they tell is part of a story, a different story, which is outside it entirely. And where they go, and what happens to them, and what their ultimate destiny is, is theirs to shape in a different sense than it is for elves to shape. Because elves are a part of the system. They're a part of Arda, right? And they are bound, to, although they, they do seem to have an ability to shape their own course within Arda, that's all they can do. They're still inside the frame. Right. Both chronologically and um, uh, spatially, they remain 
their bodies and souls remain in Arda and are a part of its story. Um, they might contribute to it in different ways, and they do seem to have the power to determine what role they play in that story. Um, but ultimately, they are bound. They are, their, their, their story um, only exists within that. But men do some, and that's why death is a gift because it's the death of mortals, um, which is different from the death of elves, which enables them uh, to go outside and beyond and be a part of a different and a bigger story. Um, you may remember that um, that passage quite near it, uh, in quite near the one I'm talking about, um, in uh, in the Isle of Lindale, that says that the children of Iluvatar shall join with the Ainur in the making of the second music at the end of time. Um, in the earlier drafts, it's only the men, not the elves, who are going to join into that music. The, the men, the children of men, will take part in that music. And the question of whether or not the elves actually do that, whether or not the elves actually take part in that, is less clear. Do they have a role? Are they done when the, world, when the history of the world is finished? And that's not really told, and it's not really known. Um, so... That's in that sense. That's what the gift of Iluvatar to men is. He gives them. It might seem in the short term like they get the shaft, right? The elves have these long and glorious lives, and they, uh, you know, and and they are more wise and more powerful, and in, in so many ways, and more glorious and more beautiful uh, than uh, than men are uh, while they're here in the world. And men just live this blink of an eye in comparison, and then are gone. But in fact, they don't have a lesser good. You could argue um, that their um, the role they're given is actually bigger and grander. And this is why uh, the mortality of the men is something that we are told the elves will come to envy eventually uh, over time. So anyway, I, fa I, I this is all, I, you know stuff that I'd been thinking about before, but it really came together much, much more clearly uh, to me from that passage uh, in The Lost Road, from the version of that passage in The Lost Road that we talked about this past time. So, uh, anyway, okay. All right. Hey, Lothrendir. Good to see you. Good to see you standing near a campfire, i.e. doing your job. Greetings. A book of heraldry that once belonged to Arvedui of Arthedane, you never believe where I found it. Yeah, yeah. I have seen the spirit of Arvedu himself. Didn't you ever go to visit the ship? Yeah, he's a central tourist attraction, man. I can't believe you never took the kids over there. I will take this at once to Rivendell, for this tale must be told to Elrond and Aragorn. Okay, I thought you were going to send me to Rivendell. That would be the normal thing. Now talk to Arvedu. Return to the shade of Arvedu. Uh, uh-huh. I knew that was going to happen. But I am prepared for you. Yes, sir. I bound myself to the milestone over there in Kuru Lairi. Yeah. I have to admit, I was kind of thinking I'd be able to take a horse out of there. But it comes in handy now. I don't have to take a horse all the way around. Yes, sir. And there is my unfriend, the stable master. Okay. Yeehaw. Let's go back to Arvedui. By the way, let us pause to enjoy the Northern Lights. Didn't get to see the Northern Lights last week. I love the Northern Lights here. I could just stare at the Northern Lights until an ice worm comes and attacks me. Which is pretty much how that always ends. It's all fun and games till an ice worm comes and attacks you. Okay. Griffith, let's go by pony until we get to the correct fjord. This the one? Next one? Next one. Yeah, okay, it's the right valley here. Okay. Alright. Back down we go. Lots of elk. Boy, the, did, did the elk take this place over? Have the elk conquered the... Oh, okay. <laughs> the Garodine, who used to run this tourist attraction, have been sacked. <clears throat> uh, the Broken Sea Monster Tourist Center is now being run entirely by elk. Yeah. Oh, sure. Oh, sure. It's the Great Chief who comes in, right? 
Yeah, you would. <sighs> Honestly. Boy, is this a party. Yeah, okay. That was bad. I knew as soon as three of them, including the Great Chief, started attacking me that that was uh, not going to go well. Mind your own business. All right, so I'm going to run away and come back. Hey, look at that. I think I got away with only Mr. Great Chief chasing me. Give it up, Mr. Great Chief. You can't catch me. I'm the gingerbread man. All right, besides these elk are moving in on your terrain here, so they're going to be after you. That's right. Just came to talk to the dead guy is all. Okay. Let's have some more limbus. Because that seems like the thing to do. Let's increase our walking speed too. That might help. Just a little bit. Okay. All right, attempt number two. Come on, Elk. Sooner you guys take this place over, the better. I think that you guys would do a much better job of running this place. Stupid great coward in chief. Stupid ravagers. Oh, no, you don't. Not this time, Mr. Great coward in chief. Okay. No, I don't have a ticket, and I'm a burglar. Okay. Ravager, stalker. How creepy is that? Hey, Arvedui. <sighs> yeah, so I do like Maven. I do like how he. we see kind of how he looked in life, right, in his portrait. But he's still moving like a spirit. <laughs> right? He's 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 doing the like like I look corporeal, but I am wafting, nevertheless. <laughs> right? Okay, anyway, it's okay. It's all good. Hey, no problem. Took care of it. Yep. Earned you one step closer to redemption, really. So like hang on a second. You cursed yourself until the day that that random book of heraldry that you once once took out of the library and never returned went back. Okay. One step to redemption. That's a little weird, but but okay, so but hang on, we're restoring the lore of the North Kingdom. I'm trying to work with you, Arved. Do we figure out how this helps your curse? Because you cursed yourself for your pride. Pride can be a terrible thing. I agree. It can make you do things like randomly curse yourself and and then assign other people arbitrary tasks. I desired out of pride to return to Fornost and cause the deaths of many elves. Well, in their in your defense, they kind of volunteered, right? I mean, it's not like you invited them. They came looking for you, but... Okay, let's not dwell on it. Either. Okay, I hate it when you do that, Arvedui. It's a little creepy. Okay. I may one day forgive my pride, but that day has not yet come. Uh, you know... I think Arvedui needs a little counseling, really. I mean, it's time to let it go, Arvedui, really. Long after the Thoraval perished, was that the ship? The sea monster was named Thoraval, was it? Another ship came into the ice bay. It too was from Mithlond, and I can only assume it was seeking news of the Thoraval and its crew. Right, so naturally, right, uh, 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 Kyrdan would be worried about the first ship and his mariners, so he sent more. Okay, uh, only, I can only assume, right, yeah, that ship also perished. Oh, man, boy, that's... 
You'd think Kyrdin would have learned better about this kind of thing. But the elves attempted to flee its destruction. I do not believe they perished in the cold waters, at least not all, but I cannot say what their final fate was. Perhaps the seer of the Lossoth who sent thee to find the ship would know. Return to her and seek her guidance once more. Saya. Okay, there is no other consonant there. I'll return to Saya, whose name I now remember. Uh, and uh, I will... Oh, wow. You've got some really lovely um, ghostly armor there, Arvedue. Oh, that's kind of cool. See how he's called Arvedue Last King, hyphenated, right? Um, uh, that's that's kind of fun, because, of course, uh, hyphenated like that is... Uh, it's Okay, well, there are a couple things there. Like, literally, grammatically, you hyphenate two word adjectives, right? Not nouns, but adjectives. Um, so you wouldn't hyphenate it if you said, like, he's the last king, right? You wouldn't, you wouldn't hyphenate, he's the last king, you wouldn't hyphenate that. Um, any more than you would hyphenate 20th century if you were talking about saying, like, I was born in the 20th century. Um, but if you say, you know, uh, I, I, I uh, dislike 20th century poetry, uh, not written by Tolkien, then you would say, 20th century, you'd hyphenate the 20th century because it's an adjective. Then I mean, that's, that's that's why you do that. So um, that uh, you know, saying uh, Arvedui last king, um, that's a it's a, it's like an adjective. So it's like the title that he that he has. Um, you know, he's not just like the last king of Fornos. I think it's cool. Tolkien does hyphenate it uh, in certain phrases, but. Um, I like the natty little beard you've got going on, right? You've got this little, this little sort of pencil goatee thing, right? That was really nice. I mean, back when you had hair and... Never mind. Sensitive subject. Okay. Uh, sorry. I'm being frightfully rude, Arvedui. I'm going to sneak my way out past the guards again. Past the stalkers. You know, maybe fewer of the Lossoth, frankly, should bring their children here on vacation. Um, all these stalkers, ravagers. They really need to screen their people better. I mean, the Goward on Human Resources uh, really needs to re-examine some of its policies, I think, when it comes to the amusement park world. All right. Let's start looking uphill. Ah, with a lovely view of the northern lights. I love the aqua northern lights. That is gorgeous. So good. Okay. And now some routine dodging of, uh, ooh, Hang on, Griff, what's a prospector? Rich ancient silver deposit? Not like you can just drive past that, right? Okay. Uh, anyway, sorry. As you were, Grifflet, up we go towards Saya, the CRS, past the village of your unfriend, the stable master, and the mammoths they won't let you ride. Hey, mammoths. Hang around. Sooner or later, I'll talk him into it. And back up to the CRS who lives in the lee of the spooky, for some reason, continuously abandoned dwarf, I assume, fortress on the hill. All right. Let's see what she has to say about the elves who survived the first, the second ship. Right? Oops. Thank you, Grifflet. Good to see your character sheet and everything, but okay. All right. Hey, Saya. So, yeah, I've been everywhere. and You are a stranger to the Looney Bay. Of course I found the body of the city master. You can see it from your doorstep. You think I'm blind? Shade of the Gaunt King? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Skipped the lines, though. Yeah, it was awesome. Most unexpected. Um, perhaps not as surprising as it might have been. The Looney what do you mean by that? Use your assistance. Okay. You'll tell me what you... You already told me about his story. But first, there are things I must do. Naturally. 
Your information does not come without a price. Oh, sure. Fine, fine. I will hear your tasks, and then you can tell me the rest of your story. Ice giants. Oh, really? I'm supposed to just go kill ten giants. They're threatening all who hunt in the lands. Go forth and meet them and draw. So drive, yeah, send a hobbit out to drive the giants out of the land. That's good. That makes sense. Okay. All right, what else? Must speak, Ooh. On the western shores of the ice bay, where the storms often rage the worst, dwell fell spirits sent from Angmar to trouble the Lossoth. That was rude. The demons raise up terrible whites and make it a place of great dread. Oh, white factories? That's bad. Go forth and banish these creatures, what the whites or the demons, from the shores of Forkhal. Okay, you will find them above this cave, south and west from its mouth, and then north into the ruins. Yeah, okay. See, I knew it must be haunted, Saya. Yeah. yeah. Kind of cool. I mean, it's kind of gutsy of you to live right next to it, right, if it's full of demons and whites. Okay. All right, so I'm looking for giants, and I'm looking for whites. How much time do we have? All right. Probably enough time to do one of the two. So let's, uh, since the whites appear to be right here, yeah, let's, uh, let's skirt the edge of the hill here and see if we can find some whites. Yeah, we're sledding. Okay. Right. Goodness. Steep enough terrain here. Okay, is this the entrance? I think this is the entrance. All right. So I just think that Grifflet in his little snowsuit and boots is just the cutest thing. Really. Is it? Ice whites, that's all? Okay. Yeah, easy enough. Um... And now, in case you're saying, well, hang on a second, isn't it, uh, isn't it rather unhobbit-like for him to be wearing boots? Hobbits would clearly wear boots in the snow, no question. Um, in fact, did you know? Many people don't know. Oh, just many people don't know uh, that Bilbo Baggins wore boots in the Hobbit, right? Not mentioned in the text, um, but depicted in the illustration. So uh, the uh, the picture of, there's a, one of the illustrations that Tolkien painted uh, for The Hobbit depicts Bilbo um, up in the, in the Eagle's Eyrie looking out and uh, uh, he's wearing, clearly wearing boots uh, in the picture. And when someone, I think it was, a, I think this was a response to a, a piece of fan mail that he got. Um, where they were talking about the, um, they were talking about the pictures, and they pointed out. They said, like, "But you said that hobbits don't wear, uh, don't wear shoes." And he's clearly, and it's never mentioned that he gets boots, but he's clearly wearing boots in that picture. Uh, Tolkien responded by saying, "Oh yes, I forgot to mention that um, he got a pair of boots in Rivendell, and uh, and wore them the rest of the time." Uh, so there you have it, uh, Bilbo Baggins, apparently. Uh, wore boots on his journey. Okay. fairly easy. I just have to kill the first five whites I see. I really like the dreadlocks that these particular whites are sporting. It is very dramatic. And the beards? Yeah. Good stuff. How many more? Two more? No problem. Oh, 
I totally interrupted your induction there. <laughs> That's so annoying, isn't it? Alright, one more. Hey, ugly, I'm up here. <laughs> I just hit him with a rock. Because it seemed disrespectful. He's looking all ominous and dreadlocky. Just seemed to take himself in a serious way. Okay. Well, it's not like that wasn't fun. All right, how much time do I have? Hey, maybe I have time to go after giants. Seriously, ten giants. Of all the annoying... Couldn't she just have me fetch something? All right, yeah, this way. That's what I thought. Okay, ice worm. Ice worm. Still kind of amused by how just like goblins and orcs, worms and dragons are different species completely in Lotro. All right. Hey, have you guys seen any giants around here? Yeah, big fellas. Frost giants, apparently. Ice giants, actually. Oh, hi there. Yeah. No, worms and garadine. Less interested. Nope, Frost Grim. Er, Gelid Grim? Yeah. Nope, not interested. Yeah, somewhere in through here. Ah, whoa, how funny looking. Look at that. Alright, let's see what we can do. Oh, I see your friend coming up behind. I see your friend. I'm going to stand over here. I don't want to fight the both of you at once. No, I don't. How strangely proportioned they are. What are these guys meant to be? Oops. Oh dear. That's not good. All right. Um, hang on just a second. Okay. Um, to go in a minute anyway, but let's see if we can at least take one of these bad boys out. Notice how they're proportioned like ants. You've got ant fingers and it really makes you wonder, doesn't it? Hey, would you mind? Can we go over here? Ooh, yeah, you don't mind coming over here. Okay, come here. There we are. Yeah. So, um, good. Here's what I was thinking, Mr. Giant. Uh, yeah, I wanted to stand up here if you if you were okay with that, because, um, you know, your friend comes along to visit down there, and I, I didn't want to bother him all at once. And that is right. Oh, 
I'm taking you down. Totally am. Come on. You interrupted my action. Don't you know how rude that is? Yes, sir. Stalkers over there. Stand where stand put. Okay, that's pre that's significantly more tedious than uh, when when Big Brother Wigand does three or four of them at a time. No problem. Hey, you. Yeah. Throw boulders at me from there. That's especially good. Oh, yeah. See, I'm wondering. Hmm. I'm wondering where these giants come from. I, I mean, like, where they come from. By where they come from. I mean, what are they made from? What's their story? I mean, you might wonder, right? Why ice giants? Why are there white ice giants in Lotra? I mean, it seems a question to be asked. Okay, enough with the stunning. I can stand you. That is a completely different story. Anyway, so why are there ice giants in, in Lutra? Well, I don't know. I can think of a couple different reasons or sort of justifications for that. How that can be. Justification number one. There are giants, of course, in Tolkien. Everyone will remember the giants in the Hobbit, right? The stone giants in The Hobbit. Um, so, you know, why not have giants? Because there were giants. Just because they don't make it to the Lord of the Rings, um, he doesn't explicitly retract it, right? I'm never going to kill ten of these guys in, what, like two minutes? Hmm. All right, one more. One more. Yeah, come here. Yikes. So, as is, there are giants in Tolkien, there, there are giants in The Hobbit, and although he does move in a totally different direction from that, we never see anything like them again in The Lord of the Rings, there is precedent. And after all, it makes a certain amount of sense. I mean, the same stories that the giants come from are, are stories that things like trolls come from. Um, of course, giants, uh, ice giants, you know, that's a very, it's a very sort of Norse thing, right? Uh, and uh, so here we are up in the north, right? And uh, we're in the northern part in Tolkien's world. And so some, you know, sort of Nordic things, um, you know, things f that sort of are derived from or related to Norse mythology seem not wholly unfitting, right? Not totally unjustified within Tolkien's world, as indeed he drew on Norse mythology for so much of what he did. All right, six more giants. Um, I think I'm going to have to come back next time. What are the clubs that they're using? Are they just, are they bone clubs? Are they wooden clubs? Are they stone clubs? What are they, I wonder? 
Uh, okay. So, thanks very much for joining me today. <laughs> yeah, that'll teach me to look at their get up. All right. Um, I'm just going to run away from giants. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining us. Tune in next time when Griffwood is still running away from giants uh, as he crosses the uh, tundra here. Stupid giant. Run away. Anyway, okay. Thank you very much, everybody. Thanks for joining me. Uh, Griffith will return, and he'll, he will vanquish, or will have vanquished many more giants uh, uh, for next time. Uh, thank you very much. And I sh we should, now, speaking of next time, we should see you next week. Next week, I'm on the road again. Um, I'm not 100% sure of the strength of my internet connection, so it, I might not be able to make it next week. I'll try to post something if I... Um, I'll try to post something if I if I if I can um, uh, in advance if I'm not able to do it. But I'm hoping that I will be able to do it. Um, so I'm planning to see you guys next week. If not, um, then I should uh, be able to see you guys uh, the week after. I hope so. Thanks very much, everybody, and I will see you soon. Bye now. <laughs>